Hello, everybody. My name is John Mark Johnson, Jr. I'm the host of Reform GGA, and today I'm going to be talking about so-called assault rifles. An assault rifle is actually a little bit hard to define, but when you hear the term assault rifle, most people think of something more or less like what I'm holding here. They think of a rifle that has a fairly large magazine, oftentimes dark in color, but it doesn't have to be dark in color, you know, the typical black rifle, uh, something that looks military-esque. That's what a lot of people think of when they hear the term assault rifle. And these rifles are, of course, the, the subject of a lot of debates uh, down through the years, recently as well as in the past. And they've pretty much been debated in one form or another uh, pretty much since their inception in uh, 1940s Germany. In the 1940s, the Germans came up with the Sturmgewehr, and it was a rifle that they referred to as their storm rifle. It was a gun, uh, much like this one, that had a large capacity magazine. It was designed to fire uh, in, full, uh, in full automatic form. That is, you hold down uh, the trigger and bullets keep coming out. It's fully automatic. and the way that they build it, the way that they presented it to uh, their own people as well as the outside world, is that this is the rifle that is going to allow us to storm the enemy position. It's going to allow us to win the assault, and thus the assault rifle was born. At the time, that was frankly mostly propaganda, and it is uh, large in that terminology. Assault rifle is largely propaganda still today. That is. The truth of the matter is, especially in modern warfare, is that rifles that are like this, whether they hold, have fire fully automatic or not, um, they're actually not the primary agent of destruction in modern warfare. That is small arms fire, whether it be with rifles, pistols, what other, other kind of firearm you want to talk about. Uh, small arms fire actually makes up the minority of battlefield casualties in modern warfare. That is, most battlefield casualties are the results of things like airstrikes and artillery strikes and things like that. Uh, small arms are generally not used as the primary offensive tool of most modern armies. That's just simply not the case. We have lots of other um, things at our disposal right now that allow our people to stay well out of harm's way and uh, deliver a lot larger pay payload. It is much better for most modern RVs to you know, push a button and drop a bomb on someone than it is to actually go there and get close enough to shoot them. Because of that, they don't get used as the primary offensive tool of most militaries. It's just not practical to do so. Instead, where you see small arms show up is usually when a particular group is trying to hold territory. Uh, they've already decided that they're going to send personnel there and to make sure that the uh, the personnel are suitably defended against antagonistic forces in the area, they give them small arms. And so even in the military context, small arms are not primarily offensive. They are not the primary offensive tools that most militaries use anymore. Instead, they are used to hold ground, which is much more so of a defensive uh, role rather than an offensive one. Now, that doesn't mean that it's exclusive. Certainly, militaries have used firearms of uh, various kinds offensively before, and they even do that occasionally now, but predominantly, their role is actually defensive. It's used to hold territory, not generally to take it. So, right from the get-go, the whole term of assault rifle and storm rifle was pretty much always about propaganda rather than the reality of how these things work out in the real world. So terminology aside, what makes an assault rifle an assault rifle in the minds of a lot of people is a combination of features that is especially dangerous in the sense that it is particularly suited to an offensive role. Well, the problem is that when it comes to gun design and most other things, a lot of the same features that have benefits in one area will oftentimes have benefits in another. So for people like myself that buy these kinds of guns on the American commercial market, our interest for the vast majority of us is not offensive, and yet we still own these guns, sometimes just simply for collector purposes, sometimes for recreational purposes. But there's a lot of us that own these guns 
because we're interested in their defensive value. And a lot of the features that we'd point out as making them great defensive guns are the exact same features that other people would say make them offensive guns, that make them into the assault rifle. So let's talk about a lot of those features. Wanna, we'll just start at the, the tip of the gun and work our way back. So on the tip of the gun, one of the first things that will get mentioned is the muzzle device. A muzzle device is a generic term for something that is screwed onto the end of the barrel. And the thing that is screwed onto the end of the barrel can have many different functions and many different purposes. Initially, when these muzzle devices were first being used, the predominant thing that they were used for was hiding flash, especially on military type firearms. Whenever a round is fired down the barrel of a rifle or most other firearms, um, there is, of course, an explosion of what is called smokeless powder back in the chamber. And that smokeless powder will burn and continue to burn basically all the way down the barrel. And if the barrel is especially short, there could be a lot of powder that still hasn't been burned by the time that the bullet reaches the end of the barrel and comes out of the barrel. That unburnt powder when it hits the outside air, it's going to flash because it hits all the oxygen out there. And that flash in a military situation is not a good thing, especially in low light conditions. If it's, you know, basically at night or something like that, and you see, you know, off in the line of trees over there, this, these little flashes of light, you can see where the fire is coming from that your group is taking, and you know where to direct your fire. Aim for, uh, aim for the flashes of light. Aim for the gunfire that you can see. Well, in a military setting, that's obviously not a good thing. You don't want to give away your position to the enemy so that they know where to shoot you. You know, that's, that's not good. And so they would put devices on the end of the barrel that would help uh, basically um, control the mixture of this unburnt powder with the outside air, with the outside oxygen, to do it in such a way that it would not be likely to flash. And that's where the flash hider was born, and that's where flash hiders come from. That was the military usage, and even in the military usage, that was actually primarily a defensive feature, not an offensive feature. That is, you use it for protecting yourself. It doesn't make the bullets that you're firing any more deadly to the other guy. They're still going to hit at X velocity and have so much kinetic energy. The muzzle device doesn't really change that to any significant degree. You might have a few feet per second difference here, here or there in terms of velocity, but it's not enough difference to really make much of a difference. But it certainly makes a dif uh, difference in your ability to defend yourself. That is, if the enemy doesn't know where I'm firing from, that's an advantage for me. So is that a military type feature? Yes, but it has a defensive application. And if you take that back from the military context down to the individual uh, uh, person on the uh, common American citizen today, uh, a lot of these people who would get these guns for defensive purposes, firing it, say, in a context like this in an apartment, um, if it happens to be at night when the lights are off, there's going to be a fairly large fireball that comes out of the end of the gun. And if your eyes are already adjusted to the night and this little fireball comes out of the end of your gun, you're going to lose your night vision. You're going to be basically temporarily blinded by your own gun that you're trying to defend yourself with. That's not good. And so the flash hider that keeps you hidden from the enemy in the military context, in the context of defending your apartment from a would-be intruder who may seek to do you and your family harm, helps you keep your night vision and keep you from going blind while trying to defend yourself. So like I said, a lot of these features that are assault type features or military type features oftentimes have advantages in the defensive role as well. And that's why people like myself and others that are interested in using these guns defense are attracted to them. So we've already talked about the muzzle device. And like I said, there's lots of kinds of muzzle devices. Um, flash hiders are just one. This particular uh, muzzle device is just what it is called a compensator. Uh, that is, whenever a round is fired, there is a equal and opposite reaction. So bullet goes out the front and the rifle is pushed back. Okay, equal and opposite reactions. Bullet goes out of the front really fast. The much larger rifle moves backward, but because it's so much larger, it tends to move a little bit more slowly. So there's an opposite reaction that's pushing into your shoulder. And also, because of the way 
that the stock is aligned with the barrel, the other thing that happens is that the gun will oftentimes rotate around your stock and it will want to come, sorry, will try to rotate around your shoulder and it will try to come up so it goes back and up. That's the normal recoil impulse that most rifles have. Well, this particular muzzle device isn't, like I said, designed so much to hide flash as it is to deal with the recoil impulse. And so the openings on it are cut such that the escaping gases will force uh, the barrel down so that it doesn't come up as much as it used to. In the military application, those kinds of muzzle devices are called brakes or compensators, um, especially compensators is the more appropriate term. A compensator uh, compensates for muzzle rise. In the military application, a lot of these guns would be fully automatic, and you want your fire to actually go at the enemy and not into the sky. And so having something that keeps uh, the barrel pointed down in the military application means that your full auto fire is going at the bad guys and not off into the clouds. What about in the uh, home environment? Well. We are not, as American citizens, generally, there's there's some exceptions and some ways you can get around it with enough paperwork and whatnot, but generally speaking, American citizens do not have access to fully automatic weapons. Even though this one looks like a military-type firearm, it is not in that it is not full auto. Externally, it looks like one, but it is not a full auto weapon. This is just semi-auto. But nonetheless, when you're using it defensively, if you happen to miss your first shot, you're going to want to take another shot. You're going to want to be able to take as many shots as you need to stop the threat to your life or the life of your loved ones. And if your gun is pointing up in the sky, when you're ready to take that second shot or realize that you need to take a second shot, that's a problem. So the compensator that helps keep the guy firing full auto on target at the enemy also helps the American citizen keeps his gun pointed at the bad guy and not at his kids in the you know the upstairs bedroom or something like that. Okay, so like I said, a lot of these features that have a military application also have advantages for the American citizen who's just simply trying to defend their home. So the muzzle device, we've talked about a couple of them. We've talked about flash hiders and we've talked about compensators, both of which have advantages for defensive users. There's other kinds of muzzle devices as well, but we're not gonna talk about them just for the sake of time. Those are the two main ones, is uh, flash hiders and compensators slash brakes. The idea is very similar with both compensators and brakes. Um, let's go back from there. One of the features that you will very often see on these kinds of firearms that are labeled assault rifles is that there'll be a front post, um, a, um, a front sight tower with a little uh, post in it. And a lot of people recognize that as being a fairly iconic thing for so-called assault rifles. Uh, this is actually part of the sighting system. Uh, what are called the open sights of the gun or the iron sights. You'll have one uh, set of sights up front and then there'll be another set of sights towards the rear that is simply used to aim the gun. This is not a particularly military feature. Most guns throughout history have had what are called open sights. They'll have a front post and some kind of a rear notch or a rear aperture or something like that. Something in the front, something in the back so that you can aim the gun. That doesn't make the gun especially deadly or anything like that. It just means that you can actually aim the thing and hit what, you're, uh, hit what you actually intend to hit. That's all that that really does. But nonetheless, a lot of people uh, are sometimes a little bit concerned about uh, those kinds of sights and they think that it's something that's particularly military because they don't see it on a lot of uh, modern rifles that don't fit that genre. For example, most hunting rifles uh, these days don't have open sights that look like that. Instead, a lot of hunting rifles, and I'm just going to use this air gun as an example, but a lot of hunting rifles will of course have a scope on them, a hunting scope, and some of them don't have any open sights. Now this particular one does have open sights, has the front little post, has a notch in the rear, but there's plenty of hunting rifles out there that don't. They just have the scope. And uh, people have argued that, you know, those 
not many, but there are some people that have argued that the open sites are a distinctively military future, uh, feature that should go away in the civilian market. Well, the reason why they're there is because the things like the scopes and red dot sites and other things that people might have on their guns, they sometimes break. And these iron sites, these open sites, are basically the, the backup system that will allow you to use it even if your other sites that you may have for some reason break or fail. Uh, so yeah, they might look a little bit scary, but their function is very much so legitimate. If you don't happen to have some kind of a specialized optic on your gun, it's how you aim the gun. You need to be able to aim the gun. You want people to aim their gun. Otherwise you get wild shots going every which way and you have run the risk of hitting someone or something that doesn't need to be hit, and that's a really bad scenario. So having sights in the first place is a good thing. But even if you have another sight on the weapon, having some kind of backup system that you can use is still a very, very, very good idea. That's not... Now, does that have offensive advantages, being able to always aim the, the weapon even if your primary system goes down? Of course, that has offensive advantages, but it also has defensive advantages. If something happens to your primary sight, you still have a way of using the gun. Isn't it a defensive advantage? Yes, but it also def has a defensive advantage as well. Another feature that some people will try to regulate are things like weapons lights, like this little uh, PL Pro uh, Valkyrie that is made by Olight. Uh, this is not a commercial for Olight, by the way. There's plenty of good companies out there. This is just the one that I happen to have on this gun. But these weapon lights, people will get very concerned about because um, people have seen a lot of movies where people use lights that are mounted on guns and it makes the guns more scary because they have lights that are going back and forth on the screen and whatnot. And again, that can have an offensive advantage you know, in intimidating the enemy and so forth. But it also has a very practical real world advantage in that if you shine a light in a dark room, you get to illuminate whatever you want to illuminate and see what you're actually going to hit before you shoot it. Being able to identify your target and make sure that this is actually what you think it is and not something else. For example, this really is a burglar who's breaking into my room and it's not, you know, just my drunk neighbor or perhaps my teenage son that decided to, you know, uh, sneak out from the house and sneak back in or something like that. Being able to identify who is actually there and what they're up to is a really important thing from a average American citizen's uh, point of view. If you defend yourself, you want to make sure you're actually defending yourself and you're not actually causing more problems and that means you need to identify what the target is. Being able to illuminate it in the low light situations is certainly helpful. Another advantage of having light on the gun is that it serves as a deterrent. That is, if you shine a really bright light in someone's face and tell them to stop doing what they're doing, they usually think twice about doing what they're doing because they can't see what's in front of them. That puts them at a disadvantage and they realize it. So are they used offensively by, say, SWAT teams and whatnot when they storm a building trying to get some terrorists out of it? Yes, they are used offensively. But that same feature that can be used offensively can also be used defensively to make sure that you're not, you know, shooting your teenage son who snuck out or your drunk next to your eh, neighbor who happened to wander into your house by accident or something like that. They have a very practical application. Like I said, they also have a role, of, uh, a role as a deterrent. You shine a really bright light in someone's face and you tell them to stop doing whatever they're doing, it oftentimes gives them a little bit of pause. And that little bit of pause might be just enough to stop them from doing whatever they're doing and make it so that maybe you don't even have to fire a shot. You just shine the light at them, say, hey, I see you, stop doing what you're doing, get out of here, whatever the case happens to be, and that stops the situation and never goes any further than that. That's an advantage. Another feature of so-called assault rifles that a lot of people get very concerned about is the infamous heat shield handguard. This AKM does have a handguard up front, actually a couple of handguards that are put together to make one overall uh, fixture, and inside of that handguard is a heat shield. 
as the name implies, a heat shield shields you from heat. When you fire a gun, especially several times, it tends to heat up. And if you were to contact that part of the gun that heats up relatively quickly, usually the barrel and gas system, if it's a gas-operated gun like this one is, if you were to touch that directly, you would very likely burn your hands. Well, the handguard and the heat shield help prevent that from happening. Now, is that an advantage to an offensive uh, undertaking? Yes. You know, if you're going to go and shoot the enemy, it's really nice to be able to do that without burning your hand. So it does kind of, in a sense, have an offensive advantage. But like I said, a lot of these same features that have an offensive advantage also have a defensive advantage. If I don't want to burn my hand in an offensive role, well, wouldn't it also be true that, uh, true that I don't want to burn my hand in a defensive role either? Yes, there are people who literally try to say that we shouldn't have handguards on our guns that keep us from burning our hands on the barrels. It's stupid. It doesn't change how deadly the gun is. It doesn't change the cartridge that it fires or anything like that. All that it does, literally, is keep you from burning your hand. That's all that it is there for. That's what a heat shield does. That's what a hand guard does, is it gives you a safe place to put your hand so that you don't burn yourself. That is literally the purpose of these things. Can Are they an advantage to people who use them offensively? Yes, because they're an advantage to everyone who uses the gun, because no one who uses the gun wants to burn their hand. To regulate something like that is the epitome of stupidity, as far as I'm concerned. All right, going back from there, one of the next most controversial issues that we get to is the so-called high-capacity magazine. Well, that is, of course, already a loaded term because it instates, uh, I'm sorry, implies a comparison that may or may not be valid. That is, AKMs like that, from their inception, always used 30-round magazines. 30-round magazines are often termed high-capacity magazines, but this is what AKMs were designed to take from the beginning. For these guns, this is considered standard capacity. Okay, so right off the bat, there's some problem in the terminology because, like I said, it implies a standard of comparison that may or may not be valid. If the gun was designed to operate with that big of a magazine, then that's not really high capacity. That's just standard for what that gun is. But aside from that, the fact that these kinds of magazines tend to hold a fairly large number of rounds, say 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 100 rounds, uh, concerns a lot of people. They would say, well, why on earth would you need that many rounds if, unless you actually plan on you know, shooting that many people? Having a large number of rounds is obviously an advantage if you plan on using the gun offensively. And that is true. If you plan on shooting a lot of people, yes, you're going to need a lot of bullets you're going to need a lot of rounds. That makes sense. But like I said before, the same features that prove to be an advantage offensively are also an advantage in the defensive realm as well. Let's think about how many rounds it usually takes to put down an attacker. Most of the time in citizen-involved shootings, it usually takes somewhere between two and six shots to deal with a single threatening person. Now, that's not a hard and fast statistic. Uh, getting accurate statistics when it comes to round count is actually fairly difficult because they're not very accurately reported. Uh, for example, it's fairly easy to know how many bullets went into the perpetrator because he's going to have so many holes and sometimes many people miscount entry holes and exit holes. Sometimes a wound doesn't have an exit hole, it only has an entry hole. Sometimes there are bad counts that way, but that's usually a little bit more reliable than the total number of rounds fired because a lot of times people don't know how many rounds uh, they, they fired. Uh, that's because these situations are stressful. If you're shooting to defend your life, your life is at risk, and that's very stressful. You're going to have a lot of anxiety, the adrenaline is going to be pumping, and there's lots of things that you're not going to be thinking of in that moment, like keeping an exact round count. And so my estimate of two to six rounds is very general, and that is based on what little data that we do have, which is generally in the form of, say, uh, badge cams, cell phone camera, security camera footage where you can actually count how many rounds somebody fires in defense of themselves. And if you're dealing with a single threat, a single uh, person who is threatening you, that is somewhere around the average. Two to six rounds 
per person that is threatening you. And most of the time, uh, the number of people that would be threatening the average American citizen is usually relatively low. Usually the number of perpetrators is usually just one or two perpetrators. But there have been situations that have been on record for which we have, you know, news reports for, uh, police reports for, et cetera, et cetera, where the number of perpetrators has been significantly higher, like say three to five. And if you're going to successfully defend yourself against three to five persons, which is not exactly a, a winning thing in the first place, uh, but having a, a gun certainly helps. And it would really help if the gun that you had had enough rounds in it to actually deal with that many people. And if it takes usually two to six rounds to deal with a single person, then if you're going to deal with up to five attackers, how many rounds is that going to take? That's going to take somewhere between 10 and 30 at least. And that's assuming that your situation is relatively typical. Well, this is a 30 round magazine. If I have to deal with five attackers, I want to have a 30 round magazine so that I can deal with all five. If I have a smaller magazine, chances are I might not have enough rounds to deal with all of them. I might be able to deal with the first one and maybe the second one, but all five, probably not. What you'd be doing if you artificially lower the number of rounds that somebody can have in their gun, say limit it to just a 10, what you're saying is that there's a certain number of attackers that they're not going to be able to deal with. It's okay to protect yourself against one or two, but it's not okay to protect yourself against three to five. You would be basically condemning anyone who gets attacked by a large number of people to basically die or do whatever these people want them to do, which may include dying or various other things. So are large capacity magazines an offensive tool? Yes, they can be used offensively. More bullets means more people killed, right? But the reality is that in defensive encounters, it usually takes more than one round to stop a bad guy. Like I said, depending on the particular gun that's being used, the particular conditions under which it's being used, et cetera, et cetera, usually two to six per bad guy. And there have been cases where they've had up to five attackers recorded at a time, which means you minimally want 30 rounds. Six times five is 30. That's why a lot of people who use defensive guns want to have a large number of rounds because they don't know how many people are going to attack them, or if ever. They just simply want to be prepared. Having a large number of rounds allows you to deal with those contingencies. Most likely you won't have to use them all. Most likely, like I said, it'll probably only be the two to six, but more can happen and it's nice to have more for when that does happen. So again, is it something that has an, ad an advantage offensively? Yes, but that same uh, feature also has a defensive advantage as well. Oops. Right. Uh, next feature that we'll talk about is the sighting system that is used on a lot of these so-called assault rifles. The sighting system on a lot of these guns is very typical uh, sorry, very atypical from what you would find on, say, most of your hunting guns. So this is what I would consider to be, yeah, at least somewhat typical for a defensive rifle, a rifle or an assault rifle, to use the, the media term. You'll see that the sight is relatively small and compact, and it does have a little bit of rail up top for attachments and things like that, and has a knob here because it's an electronic uh, sight. You can illuminate the uh, optic in it, although that's not unique to these kinds of guns. A lot of the hunting rifles will also have the option to illuminate the reticle as well. Not everybody knows that, but that's an option. But a lot of these assault rifles, quote unquote, will have relatively small compact optics that are relatively robust in contradistinction to a lot of the hunting optics. Like I said, this is just a pellet gun, but it serves for our purposes here. A lot of hunting rifles have a fairly long optic on them and that fairly long optic is uh, very adjustable a lot of times. You can adjust the magnification and you can also very quickly and easily on a lot of them, especially the higher end ones, you can adjust uh, where the point of aim is relative to the point of impact and you can make it so that you can adjust for relatively uh, long ranges and relatively short ranges at which you may be shooting. They're very adjustable, very precise, 
Uh, but they also are usually fairly long and take up quite a bit of space on the gun. For the quote-unquote assault rifles, they don't like that. Uh, neither the military nor people who use them defensively like that kind of uh, an optic system. They want ones that are much more compact, that don't take as much space, because a lot of times these kinds of guns have to be stored for long periods of time, and having something that doesn't take as, up as much space is nice for storage purposes. And then they also don't want them to be adjustable most of the time, or at least not easily adjustable. Um, and so uh, they're usually very robust, but not easily adjustable because in the military context, you're going to give this to, you know, some uh, uh, conscript or some uh, basic grunt, someone who's maybe not all that weapon savvy, and you don't want them fiddling with things and taking it out of alignments and messing up the sights and whatnot. So very simple, not overly easy to adjust, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. That's usually the order of the day to make it robust enough to use in the field, make it fairly easy to transport because it doesn't take up as much space, and also to keep people from fiddling with things that they don't need to fiddle with. Those are all the kinds of things that militaries are looking for in their sighting system. Well, those same basic features, as with everything else that we've looked at so far, has an advantage for the defensive user as well. Okay, If you're using something, just say in the context of a house, well, I don't need to be adjusting for super long ranges and you know, close in ranges anymore. I don't need something that is as precise as a lot of the hunting uh, rifles are, so I don't really need that kind of adjustability. And it's also nice to have something that's fairly robust because in the context of a home defense scenario, there's a chance that the gun might not uh, might get knocked around a little bit. You might have to wind up running through the house and you might wind up bumping into a wall. It'd be really nice if the gun doesn't get knocked out of alignment because you bumped into the wall with this. You want something that's fairly rugged. You don't have to use it at super great distances and something that's not gonna be too, something that you're gonna fiddle with, something that you basically set it and then leave it be, set it and forget it kind of thing. Uh, are all advantages for the defensive user. It just makes it one last thing that they have to worry about and it doesn't take up as much space, etc., etc. Um, that's an advantage. Another thing that you'll see on these guns that you don't usually see on hunting rifles is the idea of detachment. A lot of these optics will detach relatively easily just like this one does. I can take it on and off pretty uh, simply. A lot of militaries like detachable scopes because it allows you to put different scopes on in their place. It makes it easier to pack up the scope separately and kind of better protect it. Um, lots of advantages to having a quickly detachable scope that holds zero when you put it back on. And the same thing applies to civilian fenders. If I transport the gun somewhere to, you know, take it to, say, the gun, gun range so that I can sight it in, uh, if I can take this top piece off of the gun, I make the gun that much smaller and I can fit it in that much smaller of a case and I don't have to be bumping into things as I leave the apartment and put it in the car and whatnot. It makes it more convenient and that's what those kinds of features are. If people come along and say that, you know, a detachable scope is a distinctly military feature, well, militaries do like detachable scopes, but that's more of a convenience thing than anything else. Like I said, it aids in transportation and things like that. Um, makes it so you don't have to have as big of a case for it. Things like that. But it doesn't make it so small as to be, you know, something that's ultra concealable. I mean, this gun will take out the uh, magazine here. Okay, if I take the scope off of this gun, yes, I don't need a carrying case that is as tall anymore, but you'll still see that it's pretty stinking long. This is not exactly going to fit in my back pocket anytime soon. Okay, it doesn't make it ultra concealable. It just makes it so that the case doesn't have to be quite as large and quite as bulky. Okay. That is one argument that I've never understood. Now, if we do things to the gun that make it more, that make it smaller, that's you know a bad thing because it makes it more concealable. Well, you're still talking about a rifle, and this rifle is considered relatively short. This only has a 16-inch barrel on it. Let's compare that to the pellet gun that I've been showing you guys. This pellet gun is considerably longer. This thing is about 46 inches long. Okay, this is definitely not compact. 
And people will say, if it's not compact, that's good, because that means you can't hide it. Well, this one is considerably shorter. This is only about 36 inches instead of 46 inches, so, so there's about a 10 inch difference here. But just because it's a full 10 inches shorter doesn't mean that this thing is super uh, compact and concealable. Like I said, I'm still not sticking this thing in my back pocket anytime soon. Is it shorter than the pellet gun? Oh yeah, it's 10 inches shorter. It's a lot shorter. It's a lot handier. I can fit this in a much smaller case than I can the pellet gun. But is it enough to actually make it ultra concealable? No, it's still 36 inches long. And there's another feature that I can use to get it a little bit shorter than that. I'll show you guys here in a few seconds. But still at that, it's still not going to fit in my back pocket anytime soon. It's still not a truly concealable weapon in any way, shape, or form. Okay. And then another feature that will very oftentimes get uh, demonized as being an assault rifle feature is the pistol grip. This uh, style of grip right here is very oftentimes demonized because this is the kind of grip that you see on a lot of military type weapons. It's not the kind of grip that is used on a lot of conventional hunting rifles uh, where it's built into the, the stock more or less. Now that is also a bit of a misnomer because while it's true that a lot of modern military guns use pistol grips like this, conventional stocks were used on military guns uh, for many, many, many years before that changeover happened. For example, one of the most famous American military guns, which would be the M1 Garand, or Garand, however you, you want to pronounce it, is one that had a conventional stock on it. It didn't have a pistol grip on it, and yet it was still standard military issue. The idea that that pistol grip somehow makes it innately more offensive is a bizarre thought. The reason why these guns have these grips instead of a conventional grip is usually because of what they're trying to do with the stock, and we'll get there in a second. Uh, but the main thing is that they're trying to do things back here, and so making it so that your grip isn't a part of whatever they're trying to do back here, it's just simple pragmatics. Okay, and even if you have uh, a stock, uh, that doesn't have anything going on in, on the back end, it's still not uncommon for people to put pistol grips into them. Like I said, that pellet gun, it has basically a pistol grip type stock on it, you can see here. Now this one of course has a little bit, this uh, lower extension that goes into the, the conventional stock. It has what is called a thumb hole cut in it, but that thumb hole cut allows you to hold it basically just like you would a standard pistol grip. Does that mean that this pellet gun is now an assault rifle because of the grip? Is this now an assault rifle? My pellet gun. Isn't it an assault rifle now because it has what is essentially amounts to being a pistol grip? No, it doesn't. This does not make the gun any more offensive. It's still going to shoot the same thing out with the same kind of power. It doesn't change that at all. Is it an advantage for an, uh, being used in a defensive sense? No, it isn't. Um, nor is it a distinct advantage for someone using it defensively. No, the reason why these kinds of grips exist is because for some people they find them more comfortable than the conventional grip that would be a little bit higher up. So it puts their wrist at a better angle. It's an issue of comfort for some people and that's why it shows up on some of the conventional hunting guns. So sometimes it's just simply an issue of comfort. It's not necessarily to make the gun more tactical or more effective in combat. It's just simply more comfortable. In that sense, it might be more of an advantage. But like I said, more often than not, it's because something is going on with the stock and they don't want the grip to interfere with it. In the case of this particular gun, what is going on with the stock is that it hinges. Okay, if I try to use a conventional stock that hinged, it would produce some problems. And if you put your hand right on that hinge, like a conventional stock would, and you fire the gun, there's a good chance that there's going to be a little bit of movement on that hinge and you're going to wind up pinching your hand and that's going to be really uncomfortable. So moving the grip down away from that hinge helps keep you from getting pinched. It doesn't make the gun any more offensive, it just keeps the user from getting pinched. Is that an advantage for an offensive user? Technically, I don't want my hand getting pinched, 
But if it's an advantage for the offensive user, it's also an advantage for the defensive user. If I have to use the gun to defend my life, yeah, I don't want my hand to get pinched in that hinge. But that hinge, of course, is something that people that talk about uh, assault rifles don't like because it makes the gun that much shorter. Again, I'll point out that this gun is still not going to fit in my back pocket. I can put it in a smaller case, and generally the smaller cases do not cost as much as the larger cases, so I save some money on the case that I would put it in because it will fold over like that. But like I said, that is still not a concealable weapon. I'm not going to be hiding this under my shirt anytime soon. I mean, it's more than slightly obvious here. Yep, me and my concealed carry AK. Yeah, I don't think that's happening anytime soon, just saying. Okay. So does having a collapsing stock or a stock that folds over, that hinges over, an advantage for an offensive user? Not generally because you don't actually use the gun with the stock folded over. That is purely a transport consideration. I can put it in a smaller case that way. Or say if I am a, in the military context, if I'm driving a tank around, tanks only have so much space in them, being able to fold up the gun and you know hang it on the back wall or whatever is nice in terms of space. But when you go to actually use the gun, you don't usually use it with the stock folded over. You extend the stock so that you can actually shoulder it properly, get a proper cheek weld, and actually hit what you're aiming at. You don't actually want to fire the gun without the stock actually being deployed. Another feature that the stock has that is oftentimes considered to be an assault feature, but really isn't, is that it is adjustable. So I can pull on this little uh, lever back here and I can extend it out or I can pull on the lever and then push it back in. I can adjust the size of uh, the stock. Is that a, an assault type feature? Well, let's talk about why that is. The reason why that is, is because not everybody has arms that are the same size. To get a gun that properly fits you, you want to be able to hold the gun and keep your uh, forearm and your upper arm at a, basically a 90 degree angle and then the stock should be about one inch from the crease of your elbow. That is what you're looking for for proper fitment so that when you pull it back into your shoulder it feels comfortable. And having a stock that can adjust allows you to quickly get to that point of what is going to be comfortable for you. Hold the gun at a, at a 90 degree angle in your arm, take it so that it is one inch away from the crease of your elbow, and you're there. Having a gun with an adjustable stock allows me to make that adjustment relatively quickly and easily. And makes it so that if, say, my friends want to shoot the gun, I can hand it off to them and they can make whatever adjustments they need to make and be able to use it quite easily. If a gun does not have an adjustable stock, but was, only has one size, either the person who's using it is just simply going to have to make do, or you're going to have to accept that that gun cannot be used by certain people. For example, this pellet gun actually has a fairly long stock. This is basically a full length stock, which means that most children would not be able to use it because it cannot compact down enough for them to use it. So if I want to teach a child how to shoot, a fairly small frame child how to shoot, this would not be a good gun for it because the stock's too big. They're gonna be holding the gun way back here because it's just too long for them. Okay. For them to use it, I would basically have to cut the stock down and that means that it would no longer be usable by me. That's less than ideal. That's why adjustable stocks exist, is so that they can be adjusted for the different people that might use them. In the military context, this shows up because militaries are either volunteer-based, and you get who volunteers, which that can vary quite a bit, or it's conscript-based, which basically it's luck of the draw. Did their number come up or not? And the people that you get coming in, some of them are gonna be really short, some of them are gonna be really tall, some of them have really short arms, some of them have really long arms. And so having an adjustable stock makes sense in the military context because it allows you to fit the gun to the individual person. Well, on the American commercial market, for people who are using these guns defensively, I don't want to have to buy the gun and then go out and buy a different stock that fits me. I want to be able to buy the gun, 
And I want that stock to be adjustable to fit me so that I don't have to go out and buy another one or cut this one down, etc., etc. Yes, that is an advantage in the military context so that you can make it adaptable to whatever soldiers you happen to get through conscription or through the voluntary process. But the same thing applies to the individual citizen who may use it for defense. If the gun comes adjustable, that means I don't have to buy separate pieces later on. I can just simply adjust it to me and it works just fine. Okay, so those are a lot of the features that tr people try to ban on so-called assault rifles. But like I said, every single one of those features, while it does have an advantage in either a military context or even arguably an offensive context, those same features also have advantages in the defensive context as well. Muzzle devices can hide you from the enemy. They can keep the gun down while you're follow firing full auto into the enemy. But they can also keep you from losing your night vision in an apartment that you might be defending. They can also keep you from firing into the roof and into your kid's bedroom and actually uh, aim it at the bad guy who's coming in to do you and your family harm. Same device, but can have advantages in different contexts, not just in the military context, but also uh, in the home. Open sights. Sometimes they look a little bit scary, but the basic role that they serve is to exist as a form of uh, being able to aim the weapon even with when the primary uh, sighting system goes down for whatever reason. They're good to have. Yes, they're good to have in the military context, but they're also good to have in the civilian context. Weapons lights. Yes, they can be offensively when you're going in and you're storming the place and getting rid of all the terrorists, but they can also be used defensively to identify your target, make sure it isn't your teenage son who snuck out of the home at night or your drunk neighbor who is confused about which home is theirs. And they can also be used as a deterrent. You shine a really bright light in someone's face, it can have the effect of deterring them from advancing. And if you don't have to fire a shot to get someone to stop advancing, that's a good thing. Hand guards and heat shields. This really shouldn't need to be said but they're necessary to keep you from burning yourself and it doesn't matter if that's a gun that's being used offensively or defensively, not burning yourself is a good thing. That's not really so much an offensive or defensive thing, that's just handling the gun. Even if you're using the gun for pur purely recreational purposes, and we're not talking about offense or defense, we're just talking about going out and plinking or competitive shooting or something like that, you still wouldn't want to burn your hands. Yeah, that's not necessarily an assault feature. Going back from there, so-called high capacity magazines. Are high capacity magazines an advantage in an offensive situation where you want to kill a bunch of people? Yes, they are. But they're also an advantage if you want to defend yourself against a bunch of people as well. Like I said, in most civilian encounters, per perpetrator, per bad guy, it usually takes two to six rounds to deal with the threat. So if you have multiple bad guys, you're going to need that many more rounds. Like I said, it has been recorded of having up to five different assailants in some situations. And if it takes two to six rounds to deal with each one individually, all together, you can expect to have to spend 10 to 30 rounds on five assailants. Having a magazine that can hold up to 30 rounds is a really good thing. Yes, it can be used offensively, but it's also an, an advantage if you're defending yourself against multiple threats as well. Compact, robust optics. Yes, and a lot of militaries use them, and yes, a lot of militaries use them offensively. But compact, robust optics are also easier on the defender as well. If it's compact and robust, it means it doesn't take up as much space, and I don't have to worry about it getting knocked around. That's an advantage. That's a good thing for the defender. One last thing for them to worry about. Pistol grips. Pistol grips are primarily a matter of comfort, and the main reason why they exist is because a lot of these guns have things that are going on in the stock, and they just want to keep the grip away from the stock so that you don't get pinched when you're holding it. In this particular case, this stock folds. A folding stock is a feature of storage. It makes the gun easier to store and that you can don't need as much length to whatever you're trying to store it in. 
Does that make the gun compact enough that you can easily hide it on your person? Well, let's see. I'm going to go no. I don't think so. Also, this stock is adjustable. Why is adjustability important? Because not all people are the same size. And I don't want to have to go out and get a gun that is custom fit to me. I want to be able to custom fit it once I get it. And so if the stock is adjustable, that fits that niche. And if it's easily adjustable, that means that I can go out and I can show somebody else how to shoot relatively easily without having to make a lot of adjustments. For example, firearms trainers will often have guns that they use to train people that are in fact adjustable because the different people that are coming in taking their class, they're going to be different sizes and you want to have something that's adjustable. Or like I said, just being able to buy the gun and know that I can adjust it to me and not have to go out and buy a separate stock, one that actually fits me, but knowing that this one can be made to fit me is a real advantage. That's not necessarily an offensive or de defensive thing, that's just the fact that people are not all the same size. All right, so that is the breakdown of a lot of the so-called assault features. Now, of course, uh, that could leave a lot to be uh, desired in terms of a lot of other things that we'd get uh, discussed. Uh, for example, we didn't talk about the rounds that these uh, guns fire. Um, we didn't talk about the fire modes, semi-auto versus full auto, things like that. But in terms of a lot of the basic features that a lot of so-called assault weapons bans have tried to implement, we've gone through and talked about a lot of those external features and basically discussed why they're not overly relevant to the particular issue at hand. Yes, they have an advantage uh, for offensive use and military use, but the problem is those same exact features, literally the same thing, is going to be an advantage in a billion other contexts as well. Like I said, hand guards and heat shields, that's an advantage for whoever uses the gun in any capacity whatsoever. You don't want to burn your hand no matter how you're using the gun. That's not an assault thing. That's the way it works uh, with these guns. That's what's actually going on. All right, so thank you guys very much for your time and attention for learning more about these features of assault rifles and uh, understanding why people who are on the other side of the aisle perhaps um, think about it the way they do and uh, just generally increasing your own knowledge of the subject so that when you talk about it you actually know what you're talking about that's always a good thing to do so like i said thank you very much for your time and attention for those of you who are in christ go with god and be blessed for those of you who are not i pray that you come to know the true christ of history the only genuine savior of mankind amen